let us start our Bible study with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful to you for this time, Lord. Thank you very much for bringing us from various places. And especially uh, this meeting has become an, an international meeting. You have, kind of, you have brought us together uh, through your son, Jesus Christ. You made us brothers and sisters that we could be called one family. And this is such a beautiful opportunity that we could meet our brothers. Uh, brethren, brethren through this form, form Lord. And uh, especially as we are going to spend an hour time in meditating your word to learn about you, I pray that your, your word may be spoken to us through your servant and we may grant us your grace that we may be able to hear it and perceive it and open our hearts and minds so that we may be able to receive it. Help us. Lead us throughout, uh, throughout our uh, uh, session. Everything we do and we speak may bring glory to your name, O oh Lord, and may be acceptable in your sight. We want to hear you and to experience you more intimately, Lord. Thank you very much for listening to us throughout, your, throughout the uh, session. We need your leading. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you. Amen. Last time we are, um, we were in section 10 of the booklet and the section is titled the christian and uh, we ended by a discussion on christian behavior and uh, we were there was some discussion and questions on the, the question which asks how should a christian treat non-christians and people of other religions and we went through a very short discussion where Praveen also shared with us uh, the new commandment that uh, Jesus Christ has given to us and how we adopt that as our foundational, uh, what do you say, premise on which we or by which we treat other people. Uh, so treating others, I just wanted to recap a few thoughts from there before we move on with the next question. Um, as Christians, as disciples of Jesus, how do we treat those who are not yet come into the faith, those who are not part of the church? And we very categorically said that we treat others, certainly not with a sense of arrogance, just because we know the truth, uh, or with a sense of superiority, that as though we are superior because we know the truth. We try our best to avoid, you know, derogatory references uh, to others. And we have to be careful the kind of language we use with regards to how we would term or refer to others who are not part of the faith as yet. Uh, so the way we express our faith as disciples of Jesus, uh, should be with humility. That is one thing we very clearly brought out last time. And in all our conversations, in all our dealings, in all our connections, we try to promote peace. We are constantly told that, you know, we have to live promoting peace uh, within the church, outside of the church. We are not trying to treat others like enemies. We shouldn't forget what Jesus said. We love, we even go to the extent of loving our enemies. So all our demeanor must be to promote peace, understanding, uh, even in our discussions about our faith. Uh, and as we discuss our faith, we, I don't mean to say that we should compromise on the truth. We don't compromise on, the, on our on our belief system, but whenever we discuss, it should be done with a with trying to promote peace and understanding. Certainly, never manipulating others uh, or not forcing them to accept, you know, our uh, frame of mind or our thoughts. We must respect the others for the freedom of will and choice that they have. It if they ever want to you know, accommodate or embrace our teaching, they must do it out of a total freedom and conviction that they have come to. We don't try to manipulate them or certainly not forcing them 
or threatening them to believe in what we uh, believe. Uh, now we end last time with how, how Christians must be guided with regards to their behavior. And we said that the new commandment that Jesus gave is a very important uh, aspect of you know, the foundation on which we base all our behavior. And when you talk about the new commandment, the word new means that everything else becomes old. It supersedes everything else that we may have heard. And we take what Jesus says as new, as extremely important and relevant for our, uh, you know, for, for us to believe in. So when Jesus gives the new commandment, everything else on all the previous ones are superseded by the new commandment. All right. And if, if, I, if I don't offend you by saying this, even the great commandment, which is basically a reiteration from the old covenant, is also superseded to some extent. Now, I'm not saying it's irrelevant. But it is superseded by the new commandment. And you may wonder, well, I mean, how can that be? And for that, let me, uh, you know, uh, refer you to this booklet, which we have printed some time back. It is titled Saved, What Next? And here we discuss various aspects of Christian behavior and Christian maturity. How? Once we are saved, what is the lifestyle we adopt? What kind of a behavior we must uh, have? And how do we move on to, towards Christian maturity? And uh, chapter five particularly discusses the new commandment and how it applies to us. So I'm going to leave you with those thoughts and move on then with our Bible study. Uh, we have come to uh, uh, in in the section 10 we have come to the question number seven remember we were discussing prayer and we had some discussion on that uh, one of the reasons why there is so much discussion on prayer is that is one of the behaviors of a christian a christian is regularly indulging in what we call as prayer. And there is a very special reason for that. So the next few questions are going to deal, in fact, most of the questions that will come from now on will be dealing with prayer. And, my, and if I can say this, uh, as I was going through this, this also brings in our perspective on what we have come to call as the Trinitarian faith you'll begin to see how this begins to interplay with our uh, foundational theological perspective, which is the Trinitarian faith. So let me go to question number 10.7, if uh, Praveen can put that on the screen at this time. Uh, we finished with 10.6 last time. We'll move to 10.7. And the question here is, is prayer for the purpose of overcoming resistance from God or his neglect of us? All right. So that's the question. And let's read the answer and then we will make some comments. The categorical answer is no. Right. No to the fact that we are trying to, you know, overcome some resistance for, of God or God is neglecting us and we have to pray so that God doesn't neglect us. The answer is no. And why is it no? It goes on to say, we do not pray to change God's mind or to get God to do what he is reluctant to do. Rather, we pray to discern what God's wills, God wills and wants. As we pray to the Father, the Spirit enables us to join with Jesus, our high priest, in his prayers. Prayer is communion with our triune God. Uh, that is what is given as the answer. And uh, like I said, let's just pick up one or two thoughts from there. The very basic purpose of prayer 
is, as is mentioned towards the end of the answer, prayer is communion with our triune God. All right. Uh, that is fundamental. And uh, the very purpose of prayer is that. Now, God is a relational God. He has willed to have a relationship with us as, as human beings. He created us uh, so that we might have uh, a communion with him. And he is giving us that opportunity uh, in and through the medium of prayer to have that sense of communication because relation, uh, the relational health depends on good communication. And prayer is fundamentally that, right? So that is something that we need to keep in mind. If I can also mention, and I don't know if this probably crossed your mind, uh, you may have a question when it says, we do not pray to change God's mind. Now, you might say, well, I mean, uh, if you don't change mm -hmm. God's mind, well, what about Moses? <laughs> you know, uh, Moses prayed and uh, when... Uh, the Israelites had descended into idolatry. God was wanting to destroy them and God prayed and Moses prayed saying, you know, no God, uh, you know, uh, let's, you know, please don't destroy them. And, and it says in the scriptures that God changed his mind or uh, I, I don't know the exact wording. It might have said that God relented or repented or some, some words of that nature, basically changing his mind. What I want to say about that is this, and feel free if you should have any questions, we can discuss that a little later. You know, God's mind is, uh, 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 basically, we know God is unchangeable. He's unchangeable in his nature. He's unchangeable in his love towards us. He's unchangeable in his, his uh, purpose of redemption of mankind. That never changes. And we don't change God's mind with regards to his basic utter purpose for us as human beings, right? Um, and God is not reluctant, as it says here. He's not reluctant in wanting to bless us. So prayer is not to manipulate God, to try to somehow get him to see our point of view. He already knows our point of view. He already knows what... We are even going to ask in prayer because he is, uh, you know, very by very definition, God is all, you know, all knowing. And so he knows our minds. But if in case you have a question with regards to what it means when Moses prayed and, you know, uh, and God apparently changed his mind. You can also read Numbers 23 and verse 19. Uh, I, let me just read that verse for you um, so that you can get it from Moses' own, uh, own mouth as to what he understands and believes about God. Uh, in Numbers chapter 23 uh, and verse 19, notice what uh, Moses says. This is Numbers 23, verse 19. I'm reading from the NIV. It says, God is not human that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? So here very clearly it says, Moses himself is saying, God you know, is not changing his mind. So the way we understand when God pray, I mean, Moses prayed and God changed his mind, apparently, uh, it's not to say that God makes mistakes or, uh, uh, you know, that somehow God, you know, uh, decided to listen to Moses. God already knew what Moses was going to say. I believe that the choice of words that is used in that particular passage may be a little difficult to fully comprehend or understanding, but I believe it is more, if I can use the term anthropomorphic. In other words, it is for our benefits that we understand. Uh, it probably shows more about Moses than about God, that Moses has matured. Uh, he, the way he prays shows his sense of maturity rather than God 
anything to say about God, you know, because we know God doesn't change his mind, especially his, what you call it, uh, his uh, purpose and his resolve to save us uh, in Jesus Christ. So all of those things go together. Let me leave it at that. In case you should have any questions, we can come back to that. I'm going to go to question 10.8 now. Uh, you might wonder what is 10.8? Uh, 10 is the section in which we are in, and the 8th is the 8th question. Okay, let's read the question. It says, how does God respond to a Christian's prayer? All right, and the answer says, uh, God takes all our prayers into account, weighing them with divine wisdom, and responding to them by a perfect will. Although for the time being, God's answers may seem beyond our understanding, or even painful, we know nonetheless that they are always determined by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. God answers our prayers, particularly for temporal blessings, only in ways that are compatible with the larger purposes of God's glory and our salvation. Giving us communion with God is the heart of all the answers to all our prayers. So that is how the answer reads. Uh, once again, uh, to just to dwell on one or two, two thoughts there. Um, how does God respond to a Christian's prayer? In the best, or rather in a way that is best for us, if I can put it very simply. He does it in a way that is the most beneficial for us because he knows what we need, what we require, and he ha always has our best interest in mind. Now, the question then can come, well, what about the prayers that probably may not have been answered? Or I didn't get an answer, or the answer was no. And this is where we have various theologies that tend to indicate that, oh, if you have not received an answer to your prayer, then maybe you didn't pray correctly, or maybe, you didn't have enough faith, or maybe you didn't ask, you know, in a manner which uh, the Bible prescribes. And I think those are very unfortunate uh, conclusions. They are not biblical. Uh, and I just want to read a small section from that answer. It says, God answers our prayers only in ways that are compatible with the larger purposes of God's glory and our salvation. So his prayers are always uh, you know, or rather I should say his, the answers that God gives to our prayers is always taking our best interest into account. Please don't be tempted to think that if I'm not getting an answer to my prayer, that somehow I lack faith. And that's what lots of people would like to say. But that is not correct. And uh, uh, we leave it in God's hands in terms of uh, you know, how he wants to answer prayers. We trust him, uh, even though, like it says, sometimes we might, uh, you know, struggle to accept what God has decided. Uh, nevertheless, we continue to trust him, believing that that would have always been the best for us, okay? Okay, let's move to uh, the ninth question in this section. The ninth question in the section is, what encourages a Christian to pray each day? Let's read the answer and come back for some thoughts there. Uh, the God who has adopted us as his children is the heavenly father who encourages and commands us to pray. When we do, we are responding with love to that greater love which meets us from above. Before we enter into prayer, God is ready to grant all that we truly need. We may turn to God with confidence each day, not because we are worthy, but simply because of God's grace. By praying, we acknowledge that we depend on grace for all that is good, beautiful, life-giving, and true. Prayer is an essential aspect of our relationship with our triune God and as one of the fundamental disciplines of our life in Christ. All right, so that is basically the answer. And I think it is uh, 
quite clear in terms of what encourages a Christian to pray. Uh, let me just mention uh, one more thought there, uh, and that is prayer, like I said earlier, is, uh, is, is a communication with God. It is, it is establishing a relationship and God being a relational God, we are uh, strengthening that relationship as we pray. But an important aspect of that prayer is the fact that we are acknowledging our dependence on God. We are showing in prayer that we depend on God, on his sovereignty, on his provision, on his grace. We are not, uh, you know, we, we are not autonomous in the sense that we can, you know, look after ourselves in the ultimate analysis. There are certain things we do to look after ourselves. But we have to depend on God for the ultimate grace we need so that we may live uh, a meaningful, purposeful life. All right. So that is something I would like to add as we uh, discuss this particular question. What should encourage you to pray? Well, simply because we depend on him. And we, as we depend, we trust in him. And that's the reason why we come to him on a, on a regular basis, on a daily basis, to commune with him. And especially when we go through, you know, those issues of life that are confusing, that are difficult. We trust that he will provide us the path or the answers or other strength to be able to deal with each and every one of those issues that we face in life. So. Uh, I believe that uh, these are fundamental things that encourages us to continuously come to God on a daily basis uh, in, in prayer. Okay, we will now uh, go to the 10th question. Uh, we will probably take two more and then we will stop for some discussion. Um, what happens here now is in the 10th question, uh, this is actually going to be an extensive discussion on what is commonly called the Lord's Prayer. It is actually you know, the Lord teaching us to pray to God. So it is actually our prayer. Uh, it's not the Lord's Prayer. The Lord is teaching us to pray. But that is how it has been uh, uh, understood or rather termed you know, by many people. But uh, the question asks here, what prayer serves as the Christian's pattern for prayer? And the answer reads, in Matthew 6, Jesus gives us a pattern for prayer in what is commonly called the Lord's Prayer. And then from here onwards, the, the um, discussion is entirely on this prayer. And I was just wondering why did they sort of break down this prayer and discuss each aspect of it? And and as I was going through it, I felt, well, actually, uh, it's brilliant that they did that because it really powerfully brings in a, a, a Trinitarian perspective, which I think you'll begin to see as we go. All right. Now, the prayer is right before you in the screen. We won't go through that. Let's go to question number 11. And uh, we will pick up... Uh, the answer from question 11. Let me read the 11th question. Why do we address God as Father? Now remember, these are all references to that particular prayer which Jesus Christ left for us as a pattern. Right? Why? And the question is, why do we address God as Father? And, and I was just thinking to myself, wow, this is just, uh, you know, getting into the, the very nitty gritties of the Trinitarian theology that we have been uh, so very much uh, been discussing and embracing over the several years through our Reformation. Okay, let me read the answer and then we will uh, uh, pick up uh, some comments from it. In teaching us to pray this way, God, or rather Jesus gave us permission to address God as Father as he does. We call God Father because he first is the eternal Father of the eternal Son. Then, through and with the Son, 
we too, as children adopted by grace, call God our Father. By addressing God as our Father, as does the Son, we draw near with childlike reverence and place ourselves securely in God's hands. We do not view God the Father in the way we view our human Father. For God the Father, as revealed to us in relationship to the Son, sets a standard that all human fathers fall short of. Okay. Uh, uh, <coughs> the, uh, um, <clears throat> there, there, there is a, so much to, you know, sort of uh, take out of that answer. But I'll just uh, focus on one or two things. And uh, like I said, if any of those strike your mind and if it stands out to you, uh, feel free to comment about it because, uh, you know, there is so much we can learn from each other. You might see some things that I may not have. And uh, so I would, you know, be happy to hear some of the comments you might have. But let me just uh, mention a few things about that answer. Why do we, we are asking the question, why do we address God as father? I think the most obvious thing becomes very clear, and that is the relational becomes evident, isn't it? When we say father, immediately it talks about a relationship. Uh, a father pre presupposes a son and presupposes a relationship. There is a relationship, right? I would like to say, I'd like to put it this way. When Jesus told us to call God Father, uh, he is basically revealing God's intention for us. You see, God's intention in this relationship is one of the most intimate relationships. What God is interested in is an intimate relationship. He is basically saying that he wants intimacy in this relationship. He wants trust and confidence. It is, notice it is not a master-slave relationship. We are not calling God a master, even though we can rightly call him a master. We can rightly call him Lord. But Jesus tells us God is not, you know, he, he, he wants to, condescend himself to such an extent that he wants to be a father to us, not just a, you know, a big fat king sitting on a big fat throne. Uh, he wants to connect in uh, on an intimate basis. And so Jesus begins to introduce something which is revolutionary, which even the Old Testament doesn't necessarily focus on as much. But Jesus came to show us that just as he is the son, we have the privilege of uh, being adopted into a relationship that has, that has, you know, uh, the stamp of sonship or daughtership, you could say. When it, when it talks about sonship, it is not exclusive. <laughs> it's inclusive of humanity, which is both male and female. All right. Now, there is something else which, which, it, which it shows. It also shows <coughs> our union in Christ's humanity. When Jesus says, God, call God your father. And he says, remember, our father. So he is including himself there. And what is including there? Of course, uh, you know, we don't have the time to go unpack that. But his, in his humanity, he's included us. And we now can have a relationship in the humanity of Jesus, which Jesus shares with us, all right? So Christ is in one sense, when he says, call God your father, is inviting us into a relationship that is similar to what he has with the father. Not, not identical. Remember, Jesus is God, <laughs> but he took on humanity and he's including our humanity in him. So in that respect, it's not identical but we have a similar relationship with God the Father, just as God the Son has a relationship, you know, on that particular plane. Uh, and that's the reason why, and maybe I will end with this, in John chapter 17, uh, let me just read you that verse. Uh, 
John chapter 17, the Gospel of John, and uh, reading in verse 22, just to bring home this whole uh, concept of Father, Jesus introducing God to us as Father. He says in John 17 and verse 22, as he prays to the Father, he's saying, uh, John 17 and verse 22. Uh, Praveen, I'm not sure if you have the right, uh, if you have the right reference. Are you showing John 17 and verse 22? No, I think you've gone back to numbers. <laughs> yeah, let me read it for you. He says in John 17 and verse 22, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. Notice that, we are one. God the Son and God the Father are one. And now Jesus is coming and including us into that sense of oneness, right? And notice verse 23, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So Jesus is immersing us into the very same love the Father has for him as God the Son. We have that same love being shared with us. And so when Jesus said, call God your father, there is so much he is saying, and we can say so much more, but then let me stop there for today. There is quite a bit that we have discussed. I'd like to hear from you. If you have any comments or any questions, feel free. We have about, uh, about 15 to 20 minutes left, and uh, we can dedicate this time for some discussion. And as you are thinking of your comments or questions, lovely to see Sachin and Shanti. They've joined us. Doris, very good to see you. Uh, Linda is with us, of course. Uh, uh, and of course, our regulars. <laughs> uh, and it's so lovely to see Mrs. Noah also there. Uh, by the way, I'm not sure if you know, she's 92 years old. <laughs> Mrs. Noah is 92 years old, so that's just wonderful. Thank you, Mrs. Noah. You are such an inspiration for us. <laughs> okay, open open to you. Give me some thoughts of yours, some questions or whatever. Praveen, if you have anything to add, feel free to add. Uh, yes, David, please go ahead. Yeah, actually, um, uh, I actually wanted to comment. Uh, it's a positive comment, rather. Uh, it's about uh, the fatherhood, uh, the, the relation aspect of the Lord Jesus and God the Father. It's, uh, it's an amazing <laughs> relationship, uh, which God has given us um, freely through his son. So um, I'm just trying to understand if, if you can throw some more light on that because uh, uh, that's where the relational aspect uh, dimension is uh, very progressive and uh, it's uh, insatiable. I mean, it's always, uh, there's an opportunity to know more about uh, God the Father through his only son, Lord Jesus Christ. So would you mind to uh, throw some more light, uh, Brother Praveen, on this, if you don't mind? Uh... Definitely, we can discuss more about God the Father. In fact, uh, we have discussed about God the Father for quite a bit of time uh, yeah. in our Bible study. Uh, what I would like to do is, what I would like to say is, at this point, primarily we are, we have discussed a certain thing, uh, certain points about prayer. We'll go ahead with that. Uh, maybe once these prayer things are done, we can constantly focus, properly focus on what does it mean to call God as Father. We can discuss about it. Would that okay. be okay, uh, David? Right. Sure, sure. I have a, a question on the prayer part. Uh, coming to the book of Jonah, and uh, uh, Prophet Jonah, uh, of course, in the Old Testament, uh, God told him to go to 
Tarshish, I believe, right? If yes. I'm not wrong, yeah, Tarshish. But uh, he he takes his own choice to go uh, to uh, Nineveh. But God uh, go to Nineveh, but he, he went to Tarshish. Yeah. <laughs> and okay, yeah, that's what I was just wanting to check that yeah. the location. Apologies for that. Um, so um, God um, then um, uh, heard the prayers of uh, the people of Nineveh. Amazing. And uh, the people of Nineveh is supposed to be very, uh, I don't know how to describe them, but uh, God uh, heard their prayers. Uh, but uh, Jonah didn't took that human responsibility to go and uh, do what God has told him to do. Right. I mean, even though God was sovereign there, I, I can see the picture of God's sovereignty and human responsibility between uh, Prophet Jonah and uh, uh, I mean, just this, this is just my understanding. I don't know if, if I'm wrong, please correct me. And uh, uh, I, it's very interesting to know that uh, God uh, uh, initiated the plan from Jonah just to go to uh, the location, specific location, what God has asked him to go for. But uh, he took another route. I mean, he took his own choice. So I just wanted to uh, uh, know that point, particular point about uh, the the people of Nineveh. Uh, what uh, I mean, if you can give some more insight about that, you know, because it was a corporate prayer. I hope uh, that people uh, totally, many might have been praying, and God might have uh, opened his heart of compassion there. So would you mind to throw some light on that, if you don't mind? Because I was just wanting to know more on that part. Uh, David, I'm not sure exactly what your question is. I'm not sure if you're wa wanting us to bring a historical perspective on Nineveh. But uh, right. the, the, <laughs> the book of Jonah basically states that, uh, you know, they were corrupt and God... Uh, you know, was going to pronounce a judgment on their way of life and, Correct, wanted, yeah. and wanted Jonah to go. The very fact that he wanted Jonah to go and warn them is the fact that they would hopefully listen and repent, which they did to the absolute surprise of Jonah. <laughs> and like we had Sachin preach to us, uh, which angered Jonah tremendously. You know? uh, but... Yeah. Uh, God, you know, did not bring destruction upon them. But in an historical sense, we, uh, once again, I don't have all the details. We are told that they went back into backsliding and went back into their corrupt ways. And later, uh, they were destroyed because they, you know, went back into uh, a, uh, uh, a lifestyle which was completely corrupt. But for that particular moment, God, uh, you know, suspended that judgment upon them because of the fact they responded to the preachings of Jonah and they repented and they, uh, you know, and they changed. So I'm not sure if I can say anything more. Uh, if I, I'm not sure if I've answered your question, but feel free to clarify. Uh, anybody else would like to, if you have any historical perspective on that, you can bring it in. Not, no, not in a historical perspective, but, so, but uh, I, uh, David, correct me if I'm wrong, if I understood your question properly. Uh, are you asking, uh, did God change his decision because of prayer uh, in that way? Uh, are you asking? The no, question? no. The point is God is sovereign. So, uh, uh, so he, has he, uh, I mean, taken uh, authority over his sovereignty or? Uh, no, what is your question? Uh, can would you please uh, put put your question in one single sentence? Right, these people uh, because Jonah didn't go to that location. Yes, uh, they seemed. I mean, uh, the nature of the people over there was absolutely uh, very unacceptable in that sense. But uh, they prayed somehow. I don't know. They started to pray. Uh, so God. Uh, Awaited the judgment which was supposed to come on them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what was that actual action which God took at that point of time when uh, He averted that? Pyramid? Was it that uh, they were truly uh, asking the Lord to save them, those people? 
still uh, your question was not clear but i guess uh, uh, you asked you asked me you asked about god's attitude what really god wanted to do i i would definitely would like to say god wanted to save the people of nineveh okay he had it already in mind about he, that is what that is what his uh, nation that is what his nature he is a father he doesn't want his children to be destroyed he wanted to save his people and there are certain times we read in the bible that in order to save people he spoke certain words which may sound entirely opposite to what he has done here we need to use a simple concept uh, or simple thought of interpretation that is called the works of god interpret the words of god in the jonah story also jonah did not understand that that's why he was hanging on to the words of god god you said nineveh is very bad and you are going to bring judgment upon them and you didn't bring it and he did not understand the meaning behind it the works of god the works of god is saving nineveh right in order to save nineveh he used various things and one thing we need to understand especially when we are reading old testament and all there are certain places where uh, the words of god may sound opposite to each other in certain places there okay. we need to understand one thing change is not bad god we cannot say that god does not have any change god doesn't change in his very nature as father son and the holy spirit holy righteous whatever the fundamental aspects of god he never changes at the same time we should never forget our god is a dynamic god he is not a static god stagnated or stuck he cannot change his thought no okay. our god is a dynamic god as he is interfering with the human affairs there are certain places he played various different cards the different yeah. cards he played that does not change his very personhood or personality or who he is he changes That's how right. he deals with people based on our situation based on our understanding as pastor clearly said various sentences written various statements written in uh, old testament they show moses maturity it's not about god the change in god okay moses maturity it shows so change is not something bad we need to understand especially when we read uh, the old testament stuff uh, yeah we can uh, anil you had a question before anil before you ask a question sachin you had a thought uh because you you uh, did some research on nineveh and uh, <laughs> and jonah did you have any thought for me reading jonah was a transformation jonah was angry because he didn't wanted god's repentance to extend to nineveh and the amount of atrocities they have done he was definitely very this thing and god was very patient in chapter 3 and 4 he goes are you still angry and he goes on saying na 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 da 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 you have to do give him one more give him one more day goes through this, this situation are you still angry at the same time he is dealing with the people of nineveh is also dealing with uh, jonah. jonah his transformation of heart and for him to see the loving nature of god okay and all this while and and other thing i wanted to say is if you would have gone the reverse way it would have been much easier if you would have started with uh, 10.11 first god the father and if i know that i have that privilege of calling god the father i would know that uh, he has my best intention and i have his promise which says everything you ask and that is in my father will i will do it then if a question come to me do you want to change god's heart no because he has my best intention i would not probably would like him to change i want me to change his heart for me to change his mind for me because that's the best intention he has however there are times when we pray and god deliver us now would god have delivered us if you would have not prayed probably yes but there are times when we gone on our knees prayed and cried and he has delivered us from certain situation much early then probably um, if the transformation would not have come so so i have seen the timing or sometime there is the same formula we have used and god still want us to go through the situation so that we learn more thing and the same formula does not work and we go through that situation and this is for our student information at that point perhaps we might see that the set for formula of communicating and god answering is probably not working because he want us to go through that phase can, can i add yes sir shanti go ahead 
Okay. Um, I wanted to bring about that in that particular point. I mean, it's a good example that Dave was trying to, I mean, as far as I'm, I was able to kind of understand Dave, he was talking about, uh, you know, when people prayed, or when people, Nineveh, or, uh, people of Nineveh prayed, yeah. God, he, he was trying to do that. There was a change of plans. So with the prayer, I, I guess that is what he was asking, kind of. I, I'm not sure. But nevertheless, to that point of, uh, you know, 10.7, 10.8, I wanted to bring this about as well. Proverbs 19.21 says, many are the plans in the mind of a man, which is true. But it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. At the end of the day, what his plans and purposes are, they will be fulfilled. Whether we, we get in the way or not, that does his plans. But what he expects of us, like, you know, like a good, good father would expect his children to be compliant, to be obedient, to be in love, to respond to a father and say, uh, my child, please don't do this. I want you to be like this. You know, he expects our response to be compliant to his wishes and desires. And that is why also this whole thing comes. If, uh, what, what is it? I will grant you the desires of your heart, but when there is a, there's a catch, isn't it? Many people read only that part and then just leave it. But if it is thy will, right? So I want to just extend that part as well and say, even Jesus asks in Luke 22, 42, Father, if you are willing, now he is asking the father, he is praying, please change your mind. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. So it's a good example as well there. Where, but then he goes on to say, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Because at the end of the day, his plans and his purposes are fulfilled. Then uh, Psalm 69, 13 also says, um, but as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord, at an acceptable time. In the abundance of the steadfast love, answer me in your saving faithfulness. And I find that very interesting. Not only, you know, Lord, according to your will, but an acceptable time. So sometimes maybe, you know, at that point of time with the, the people of Nineveh, the Lord thought, oh, I, I could, you know, it's not at, a, at his acceptable time. He could have thought that. And when uh, Moses prayed, he said, well, this is acceptable to me. And maybe, you know, he had, it. this is still fulfilling the things. And in the way the response was, uh, you know, that could also be been, because at the end of the day, he is a good, good father. And he does take our desires into consideration. But at the end of the day, it is his purposes and plans that are fulfilled. Good. Uh, thank you for those thoughts. And I think... Uh... Uh, like uh, Praveen said, you know, his relationship with this is very dynamic and there are always some permutations, combinations, but ultimately his purpose stands. Okay, Anil, you had a thought. Please, please come in. You need to unmute yourself, Anil, before you talk. Yeah. No, the, the administrator has to unmute me. Can you hear me? Uh, you are a little faint. Could you come closer to your device? <laughs> okay, can you hear us? That's better. That's better. Just a thought. God created us for his glory. So uh, the main thing is that they were a trinity. They didn't need man, but he wanted to create us so that we could glorify him. And that is the main purpose of man. So that you know, the eternity is always created from the beginning that this is what's going to happen. We can have our purposes fulfilled because God has so many uh, options for him. But uh, in the end, it's God's purpose that has to be fulfilled. Yes, yeah, Rekha. Yeah, go ahead, Anil. I, I had a comment that God is sovereign. This is regarding changing his mind. <clears throat> God is sovereign and his will will be done no matter what. So even if he changes his mind to, to, to complete his overall sovereign will, what is the problem? <laughs> I mean... <laughs> Really, I mean, God is sovereign. So as long as his overall will is being fulfilled and he's working towards that purpose, does it really matter if he changes his mind? Yeah, well, uh, if you look at it from that perspective, it is good. Uh, only thing we shouldn't think that God is not trustworthy because he's going to change his mind. 
That is one thing. His overall will. That's his overall will. As long as that is there, even yeah. when we pray, it is according to his will that he has to answer our prayers, right? So Absolutely. That's right. what I, I thought. Yes. I and if I can just tell Rekha, what you said, Rekha, is uh, certainly true. I mean, we are created and, uh, you know, uh, we, we bring glory to him. It is, we have to be careful to understand that God is not seeking glory. Uh, he, he, it, is as, it is not as though he is going to be shortchanged if we don't glorify him. Uh, you know, our relationship with him brings glory to him, but as he is glorified, it, we benefit. Yes. And ultimately for our benefit. We are not yeah. benefiting God in any way. I mean, so I thought I'll just mention that. Yeah, that's true. No, as John John Piper, Piper one says, of the yeah. pastors here, his famous line is, mm -hmm. "We are most uh, when we are most satisfied in God, He is most glorified in us." Yeah. Okay. I thought that's very well put. Okay. Well, you mentioned John Piper, and yeah, some of his thoughts are pretty good, but I am not sure if this is correct. Maybe Praveen can uh, tell me if it is right. I have a feeling he is more into the Calvinistic thought, which uh, Good. which is something which I am not very. I mean, we are not very comfortable with that. Uh, pure Calvinism. We don't believe in predestination. Uh, the way we explain predestination is different from what uh, Calvinists would do. So maybe we can have a discussion on that sometime. Yeah, that would be lovely because I want to understand that predestination. Yeah, the Bible does preach that, doesn't it? Sure. Um, okay, well, uh, time goes by when uh, we are enjoying ourselves. <laughs> uh, Hello, uh, Mrs. Any Hello. final comments? Yes. yes <laughs> Sorry. Rekha, you had a comment? No. No, no, that's it. Okay. Any other thoughts or questions? We can just take a few more minutes before we close. Right. Uh, just one one thing, one single minute. I'll. Uh, uh, yes, Anil, Anil had a thought, uh, Praveen, before you come in. Anil, go ahead, finish your thought. Uh, you know, no, uh, this you had meant you were reading from this booklet and you said it's on the GCI website. I I I clicked on literature and I it does I I see divine healing and okay Bible prophecy, Grace Communion Church beliefs, and God revealed in Jesus Christ. Where is this booklet? Okay. Praveen, uh, would you be able to send that link to Anil? Yeah. Praveen will send you the link and you can go directly into that. Good. Thank okay. you. Praveen, go ahead. Yeah, it is uh, It is a, it's a small point regarding uh, the changing or uh, change of, uh, I mean, God changing his decisions or thoughts and all. David puts a uh, uh, statement uh, in one of his uh, Psalms. He says, uh, God has shown his works to the children of Israel and taught his ways to Moses. Children of Israel have seen the works of God. The all ten, ten miracles you see or whatever they have seen in the 40 years. But they could not understand the ways of God. Moses could understand the ways of God. If you read the first five books, especially from Exodus to uh, Deuteronomy, some of the incidents that happen in those books are really scary. The way God expressed his anger was really very bad. And so there are places where Moses was constantly pleading God, God, don't bring your judgment or wrath upon these people. And certain places, God, Moses says, you, these are your people. And God says, no, they are your people. <laughs> Such conversation was constantly going on in the first four, I mean, those four books. And uh, so those, those incidents are really scary just because of meat. Thousands of people died. You you know the incidents, Korah and children, the earthquake came and swallowed people. Those are really very scary incidents. And at the end, Moses says, the Lord is slow to anger, abundant in love. It is because... They have, children of Israel have seen the works of God and they always sing and say, you have brought us out of Egypt, you have brought us out of Egypt. But they did not understand the heart of God. Here comes mm -hmm. Moses. 
he has seen the works of god and he understood the heart of god that's why he said uh, you know he is very slow to anger and abundant in love in spite of what all happened in the port on those 40 40 years he said that it it is the same thing with jonah as well jonah must be looking at the works of god and he was saying you said this why are you not doing it mm-hmm. and uh, at last in chapter 4 god reveals his heart or his ways so throughout jonah chapter 1 to 4 what we under what we see is certain works of god some words of god are there but we should be able to connect to the ways of god how he worked with jonah in order to save nineveh so that's what we need to see when it comes to god changing his mind there are so many incidents we can pick up in the old testament and we can argue on them so best thing we as christians need to find is we need to find the thread the connection between the works and the words which help us to understand the ways of god right so this is regarding <laughs> yeah and uh, certainly shows us that the need for a maturing process and uh, time has gone by and as we close i just want to tell you if you have this book just go ahead and read it again it will give you some thoughts on uh, the christian maturity and behavior aspect and so uh, it will bring you some thoughts so uh, thank you again for joining us today we are doing this every wednesday evening uh, we do it for an hour with discussion and uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, of course the next one will be our worship service on sunday which don't forget is a communion service and so we will do communion online uh, you have to prepare your own elements for that uh, so bertie if i can request you to close in prayer bertie can you hear us if you can uh, unmute yourself and uh, you know do do the honors by closing the bible study in prayer can you hear me okay Let's bow our heads. Father God in heaven, uh, uh, through your spirit of your son in us, we call you Abba Father. And we are so grateful and thankful for another opportunity to uh, learn and uh, to be taught, to, to discuss, Lord, and kindly continue to bless us with the right attitude, Lord, of confessing, and lord acknowledging blessing honoring lord to be more christ like lord you have already brought us into christ and lord you, uh, we are body of christ and lord we want to lord uh, to be uh, continuously in the process of uh, being more like your son jesus christ uh, who has life lord we are grateful thankful for all that he did for us to reconcile us lord to offer the forgiveness and to have newness of life in us we are a new creation and lord thank you so much whereby we can call you abba father thank you for your people lord uh, that we may continuously be growing uh, uh, as a family and trusting you obeying you lord and we need to lord uh, be doing this faithfully thank you for this time together lord bless your people and uh, you continue thank you for your love for us and lord your mercy for us father help us to come again together on sunday uh, for worship where we will be taking communion help us lord to know that we are joined to christ we eat and drink of christ lord and we live our living is in christ let christ likeness show forth lord through us uh, lord we Yes, we don't bring you glory, Lord. Your glory of yours shows forth through us. It's more for our benefit, Lord. Father, fulfill your purpose and plan for us each, Lord, day by day. Father, we pray all this in the blessed and glorious name of a great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.